fantastic. Um, it, it is International Women's Day, and I wanted to play something for you from a friend of mine, Katayun Gudarzi, uh, an Iranian-American who performs the poetry of Rumi. Um, and meanwhile, you can see from the Sanctuary Cafe in the United uh, University Church in Hyde Park, a wall that's painted with repeated versions of the word love, esh, in Persian and Arabic. And that's painted by another Iranian female uh, artist, uh, Iranian-American female artist, Sarveen Hariri. So let's listen to that. So she's going to be reciting a poem in Persian from Rumi. It's, this is my translation of the poem she's reciting. you to have a sense of the oral and sensually oral quality of the poetry because Rumi is not a theologian, he's a poet primarily, and the theology that he speaks of or the theosophy that he speaks of is remembered uh, today because of the poetic format that it's presented in. I'll give you another example of a uh, musical rendering of one of his poems. This poem is actually for a devotional gathering of Sufis as they're arriving into the room. So again, keep in mind that all of this that's happening in what we'll read from quotations is in the original rhyming verse. A word about nomenclature. So Rumi is only Rumi, that's a very familiar name for him, uh, since about the 1980s or 1990s. 
He's got a lot of names, as do many medieval people from the Islamic world. His name, if you break it down, in Turkey, he's known as Mevlana. So that's this, uh, whoops, this uh, version of Mo Molana. So Mevlana is the Turkish pronunciation of Molana. Part of the problem in the variation of names is that there are several language communities that uh, honor his memory. And so he's got different names depending upon, uh, different pronunciations of his name depending upon which part of the world the uh, speaker's linguistic community is immersed in. But that name Molana means our master. It's something like rabbi. And it's not his real name, it's a title. Jalal al-Din is another title, the glory of the faith. And up until relatively recently, the 1980s, you would always see Jalal al-Din Rumi because Rumi by itself really indicates where he lives. It does, it's not actually a name. Rumi means somebody who lives in the former Byzantium. So Turkey, as it was being Islamicized, was known as Rum. Uh, Eastern Rome. And Rumi means simply somebody that lives in Anatolia or what's now Turkey. So it's not really appropriate to call him Rumi because it doesn't distinguish him from the tens of thousands of other people that also live in Anatolia. But there's a whole host of names. His real given name was Muhammad. Muhammad is a pretty common name um, for boys in the uh, Middle East. And he was born in Vahsh which is in modern day Tajikistan. But most people think he was born in Bakh, which is in Afghanistan. So the Tajik government claims him as a Tajik. The Afghan government claims him as an Afghan. The Iranian government, because his language is Persian and Iran is the largest uh, Persian speaking country, claims him as an Iranian. Uh, but Turkey, because Turkey is where he lived, claims him as Turkey's greatest gift to human civilization. He was born in 1207, and he died in 1273. And I just want to lay out a little bit of information about the context that he's living in before we talk about the things that he said. So he starts off here in Central Asia, and he winds with his family winds up eventually in Konya, which is the capital of the Seljuk Empire, a Persian-speaking empire, but Turkic by ethnicity. And it's in Konya that from about the age of 25 or so, he lives most of his life, and it's where he wrote all of his poetry. Um, these are some important dates in his life. We don't really need to dwell on them, but if anyone is interested, we can go back and look at those later. If you want to have an image in your mind of what Rumi looked like while we're talking about him, um, you have a problem, which is that no one really knows what he looks like. There was no portrait done during his lifetime. Here is one yearbook photo of uh, Rumi. Here is a Turkish image from pre-modern period, maybe the 18th or 17th century. Here is how he looks in India. Here is how he looked in 19th century Iran. And this is what Newsweek thought of him, a Persian love machine in 1998. After Demi Moore and Goldie Hawn and Deepak Chopra were promoting him. So he's kind of an iconic figure, and yet no one is really sure how to portray him, or the, better put, they all portray him differently. The government of Iran and the government of Tajikistan and the government of Turkey proclaimed uh, 2007 uh, the year of Rumi because it was the 800th anniversary of his birth. And the UN also came up with an iconic version of what Rumi is or looked like, and they put it on this coin so you could actually get a UN Rumi as well. Um, as I mentioned, he lived most of his life in Konya, and his life story intersects with the life story of another person called Shams, Shams Adin of Tabriz, Tabriz being a city in the northwest of Iran. Uh, Shams's grave is said to be in Konya. 
And this is what Shams is supposed to have looked like according to a modern uh, draw, drawing by an artist of him. And what's important about Shams is that he really did transform the spiritual practice of Rumi so that when Rumi started composing poems, he said, he, he titled the poems that he was writing the poems of Shams. It's as if he's speaking through the mouthpiece of Shams. And you can see in these quotations from poems of Rumi uh, where he's adopting that identity, son of truth, and that's what Shams al-Din means, Shams al din which is the title of Shams. Son of truth and faith, pride of Tabriz, speak, but it is your voice that mouths all my words. My thoughts and reflections inspired by you as though I were your phrases and expression. So Shams is an incredibly important personage in Rumi's uh, spiritual outlook and praxis. Most of what we knew about Shams was very legendary, hagiographical kinds of saints' lives that were written about them, including stories about how they first met, which are untrue. Um, it turns out that Shams met Rumi when he was a student in Aleppo or in Damascus and came to Konya because he thought Rumi had potential. He was going to help him transform into a spiritual leader and he thought that Rumi needed his Shams's uh, ability to, iconoclastic ability to not care what people thought. So Shams came there and here's a modern imagination of what that first meeting, famous meeting, which involves books jumping in the water and catching on fire and all kinds of miraculous things. So Shams, according to some of those saints' stories about Rumi and Shams, uh, was supposed to have been killed by Rumi's jealous disciples. That's not true. As you saw, he's buried in Konya, he's also buried in Hoi in Iran, and he's also buried in uh, Multan in Pakistan, so he got around quite a bit. Most, <laughs> most likely this is where he was buried, but those are not his bones. However, if you go there, they will show you. I'm not sure which skeleton is his, and I don't think they are either. But it's important to note that the spiritual power in hearing in the bones of a person a saint like this is, as it is in the Christian tradition, thought to carry uh, a special power if you visit it, a baraka. Um, and so the relic, these are almost certainly not Shams's bones, but it doesn't matter because people go and they derive inspiration and a kind of power from that. So they also go to visit Rumi's shrine in Konya, uh, this is the place where he was buried. Uh, you can see from a distance his shrine there. It's notable for the green dome uh, over the shrine. And uh, many of the other members of Rumi's household and his early disciples are buried there. It's now a museum, which is to say that the Turkish government did not like people visiting it as a shrine. Uh, after 1926, when the Turkish government became a republic and abolished the Ottoman Empire, they banned all of the dervish communities. And so they allowed this shrine to continue operating, but as a museum that you could buy tickets to and go visit, and they didn't really like people praying at it. However, if you go there today, you'll see lots of people who come to pray for various things, like praying for health, praying for a husband, praying for this, that, and the other. And that's the actual sarcophagus over uh, the place where Rumi is buried. And this is a copy from the 14th century of his divan or collected poems. Uh, these are the lyrical poems or the ghazals. We now have ghazals in English. There are a number of English or American poets who write poems called Ghazals, you can think of a sonnet as an approximate idea of a short lyrical form that is the Ghazal. This is a collection of his poems. There are 33,000 lines of poetry in this work, um, but that's not all the poetry he wrote. Just so that 
we have an idea of what we're talking about here. A Ghazal is a lyrical poem. As I said, all Persian poetry is rhyming. It's all metered, so it's verse. These are about five to 14 line poems. The poet usually uses his pen name. He signs off the poem saying, it's often a stage name. And Rumi uses Shams's name usually, uh, or he uses the name quiet. Like he comes to the point where you can't explain what he's trying to explain anymore. And he says, hush, and that functions as a pen name for him. So these are mono rhyme poems. Uh, the same rhyme occurs at the end of each line of the poem. And they're in the same meter. So the whole poem is in one meter. Uh, this kind of poetry was initially a love lyric. So it was the love poem. Uh, but as it became a fixed form of poetry, it was no longer necessary to specify that it be a love poem. And people could write. Uh, on mystical topics or philosophical or political topics. And it's the most important or most practiced and beloved genre of Persian poetry. Um, since it started as love poetry, there's a lot of discussion of love and of eros in uh, this kind of poetry in the Ghazal. Also in this kind of poetry is a great deal of discussion of wine to the point that people are confused about whether poets in this tradition, particularly the Sufi poets, are talking about real wine or they're talking about some kind of symbolic wine. And sometimes you can't tell. Sometimes it's fairly clear. But it's a very accepted form of discourse where wine represents the mystical experience, something that transcends the rational apprehension of the world and sort of destabilizes you. It makes you maybe see things that you wouldn't normally see. And uh, you become, ideally, intoxicated with the divine beauty. Um, so interestingly, in combination with the language of the love poem form of the Ghazal, there's a fair amount of Islamic thinking that describes various kinds of love very minutely, like all sorts of love, passion, friendship. And there are manuals that talk about this. So there's love that is an appreciation of beauty. There is the kind of love we think of as agape or caritas. There is passion. There is eros. Um, Specifically, there is love that sticks to the heart and love that reaches the pericardium. There is a kind of thraldom. All of these are different words that describe a particular kind of experience related to love. That discussion goes on among Islamic legal scholars. So it's something that's integral to the tradition and is not anything that people feel shy about. But in the language of love poetry, uh, many poets before Rumi and Rumi himself also are explaining things in terms of the worshiper as the lover and the godhead uh, as the beloved. So you can have a language that's quite erotic or you can have a language that's tamer and a little bit more uh, obviously symbolic but they're often mixed together in the same poem. Uh, so his theology draws both on the idea of love as eros and love as agape. And one of the quotations from his poem says, agape then describes what's real, eros too. And so that's kind of the theme, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. If you're wondering what a Ghazal looks like on the page, it looks like this. It's, of course, going right to left. Um, but just so if you want to have an image of what the poem looks like, those colored headings are setting off one poem from the next poem. So that's about the middle of that. It's about the length of a typical Ghazal. Rumi also wrote a book in a different form of poetry. This is 25,000 lines long, and it's divided into six books. It's not lyrical poetry, it's narrative poetry. So this tells stories. Tells stories usually about 
five to ten lines long, sometimes much longer, and he interrupts the story often to moralize or to tell you what it's supposed to mean, for him anyway, and eventually returns to the story later on. Uh, but sometimes it's just a very short story. He's a very good uh, depictor of human characteristics and motivations. He's very attuned to social interactions. Uh, but he always wants to talk about something that relates the subject to the divine. So those, he says, those stories are akin to, um, he says he doesn't really like poetry. So, so far he's written nearly 60,000 lines of poetry, as we've been discussing, uh, which seems difficult to believe for somebody that really doesn't like poetry. But what he describes the process of writing poetry uh, to be like is gutting a fish to serve it to your guests. It's disgusting. You don't want to put your hand inside the fish. And that's how he says that he feels about poetry. Probably part of that is um, aimed at the community of religious scholars that he comes from. So they look down on poetry. And he doesn't want them to think that he's rushed off and embraced this and abandoned his background as a religious scholar. But this is a copy of his Mass Navi. Not very many of them are illustrated. This one happens to be illustrated. This is a copy that was made in Esfahan in 1602. Mass Navi, uh, which is the name that is used in a short form for this work, is actually the name of a verse form. It means couplets. And the full name of this poem is actually Mass Navi, Ma Navi which means spiritual couplets, or the couplets of true meaning. So uh, it's a verse name and the kind of assertion that what Rumi is talking about in this book is the actual essence of spirituality or the true meaning of spirituality. And in fact, the beginning, the prose introduction to the book claims that it is the roots of the roots of the roots of religion. And that's playing with a term that's used in Islamic scholarship uh, in which legal scholars and historians of Islam talk about the discipline that they pursue in studying Islam to be the roots of religion. So Rumi is trumping all of that kind of study and saying this book is the roots of the roots of the roots of religion, if you must know. So this form is uh, also rhyming verse and it, however, rhymes in couplets. So instead of having one rhyme all the way through, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, and changes from line to line. The kind of poetry that's written in this meter is epic or romance, uh, also religious and mystical. Um, and many of the poems in this form are several thousand lines long. So it's not unusual for a poem to be 6,000 or 10,000 lines long. This one in six books is 25,000 lines. That's a lot of verse. Also, it's worth pointing out that one line of Persian verse is 22 syllables in this line. So if you think of iambic pentameter, that's 10 syllables, right? So it's 25,000 lines of 22 syllables. So it's approximately like more than 50,000 lines of Shakespeare's iambic pentameter. It's a long, long poem. And if you were to see it on the page, it might be laid out like that in columns. OK, so this background for his poetry is a Sufi idea. Uh, where there are communities of people led by a guide who has been walking the spiritual path and may have some visionary experience. He may be somebody who shouts out things in a state of ecstasy like, uh, verily, I am the truth, which can get you in trouble. I don't recommend that you try that. And neither does the Sufi tradition, by the way, because people that did that sometimes got executed. Um, it focuses on a kind of esoteric interpretation of the Quran that requires a knowledge of the interior meaning and of the interior life of the spirit. And it includes manuals and individuals who transmit a orientation towards Islam that is uh, replete with these kinds of ideas. It's also 
the case that Sufis talk about the greater jihad, the lesser jihad is struggling uh, in combat to defend the territory of Islam. For Sufis, the greater jihad is struggling to slay your lower self, the baser self. And that is how one achieves perfection. So you do that by fasting, perhaps, by spending time in seclusion, by daily calling yourself to account for the things that you've done. And there are technical terms that explain how you do these things and what they are. Uh, many Sufis go around begging with a traditional begging bowl like that because they insist that if you rely upon God, it must mean that you're not doing a job and putting money into a 401k because that's hardly relying on God. That's relying on your own ingenuity. And if you really want to rely on God, then you shouldn't plan for tomorrow. You can just go around begging. Um, you also are supposed to learn from the saintly example of companionship with a saint or a guide called a sheikh or a peer, which are the terms respectively in Arabic and Persian for an elder man. Um, and you're supposed to practice a kind of introspection to weed out your less good intentions, your less virtuous intentions. So they talk about this Sufism, which is not a term that most Sufis like to use for themselves. It's sort of pejorative. It's a, li a little bit like hippie. So if you think back to the 1960s, the folks who were gathering in 1967 in San Francisco did not call themselves hippies. That was something that the media um, pinned on them and um, was meant to belittle them. And they took it on themselves and began to celebrate the idea well, Sufism is sort of the same kind of a phenomenon. It was meant to look down on the people that were practicing this kind of spirituality. They used the term tariqa, which means road or mode or path. And there's a long history of this before we come to Rumi. Rumi talks about the relationship of that Sufi path, the tariqa, to other words for path in the Islamic tradition. The Sunnah is very, very important. That's what those Islamic legal scholars study when they want to know what the Prophet's example says. How did the Prophet behave? What did he say you should do? That's known as the Sunnah. If you study that following certain legal principles, you arrive at a knowledge of law and ritual, the things that you should do. That is called Sharia, which is in the news often these days. So Rumi says the relationship of these three things to each other is uh, something to think about. And the tariqa is the one that he's following. He doesn't want you to throw the other ones away. He says that they're uh, akin to a candle, the sunnah that lights the path for you. And the sharia is the actual path itself that you follow. And tariqa is the way that you move down that path. So it's the experience of actually applying your knowledge of walking and uh, movement through uh, the spiritual path. Let me just briefly mention that one of the things that Sufis do is they gather in listening sessions, majlis. Uh, you can think of them as a concert, but they don't think of it as a concert. They think of it as a devotional gathering, which is using music, usually with a text of a poem, not the Quran, because you're not supposed to sing the Quran. You can chant or cantillate it, but you shouldn't sing it. So that usually it's a poem, and the poem is supposed to help them to concentrate on God and to uh, gather some insight, hopefully to fall into a kind of mystical receptivity, which some people think of as a trance. The technical term for that is hall. But there are many singers that will help you to do this. And let me give you an example of one modern Pakistani Gawali singer. This 
This is Nostrad Fata Ali Khan. So we can't spend too much time on this because uh, you have heard in the beginning with uh, Shahram Nazari, the second musical piece that I played for you, how the music will speed up and drumming will start. This is typical of this kind of musical performance or spiritual concert. So I'm going to show you something else that Sufis do without music. Uh, and it's uh, called remembrance. So they're using, they're chanting a name that's associated with the divinity. It may be accompanied by movement, as it is here. And they're chanting, there is no God but God. Another kind of meditative practice is the practice of the dervish community that was founded by the disciples, the immediate disciples and sons of Rumi, who are known as the whirling dervishes in the West. That's not what they call themselves. And they don't call what they're doing whirling, and they don't call it dancing. They would be upset if you called it that. Uh, they call it turning, actually. Uh, but what it is is a motive form of meditation. And they first get permission before you practice this at all, you had to serve for a hundred, for a thousand and one days, basically three years in the kitchen of the Mevlevi Lodge, of the Order's Lodge. And then you would get permission from your uh, spiritual guide, uh, which you can see happening here. And you would perform a kind of turning meditation and they would start like this in front of the guide and then they would after turning eventually wind up with one hand down towards the earth and one towards the heavens so this is the mevlevi dervishes as they're currently constituted some group of them you may have seen this So this is a form of meditative, emotional meditation. And this is the community that they do this in the name of Rumi. And typically, the lodges where this was done, uh, they would read his Masnavi, and then they would perform these uh, spiritual concerts. This is the oldest existing copy of his Masnavi. So this was copied out in 1278, which is about five years after he died. But it, it says at the end, the scribe has written his name, and it says that this was copied from the copy of the author. So they're concerned about authenticity. Uh, so this is a very antique copy of the Masnavi. The Masnavi begins by saying or asserting that uh, the words that you're hearing are the complaint of a flute, of a reed flute. And the reed flute is weeping over the fact that it's been cut from its bed. So it's divorced from its source of origin. And what happens when it's divorced of its source of origin and it's weeping? It makes a plaintive sound, which is the sound that you hear when a reed player plays his flute. And the the flute is speaking in the beginning of this poem. It says, I raise my plaint in any kind of crowd in front of both the blessed and the bad. All befriend me, hearing what they want to hear. None seek those secrets that I bear within. And that's one of the things that Rumi often returns to, the idea that the people that he's composing poetry for are not scholars. They're not mystics. They're common people. They're the townspeople. And they are listening to his poetry to get out of it what they can, what they, maybe it's the love lyrics, maybe it's some of the things that are on the surface, but what he's really interested for you to get out of all of this is what he thinks are the mystical secrets that are embedded inside of it. Um, 
So he talks often about the idea of love, which is what we were going to concentrate on this evening. Um, the idea of love is that if you're, especially if you're engaged in the kind of uh, trance-like state of the Sufis produced by those mystical concerts, you're beyond, you're, you're immersed in a dimension that's beyond the question of faith and infidelity. So love is uh, a higher ground that transcends the kinds of concerns that you might have about what's good action according to religion or bad action. Um, the beginning part of the Masnavi also says that love is the physician that cures all of our ills. It's both a Plato and a Galen who are figures from the philosophical tradition that are important in the Islamic context, both for philosophy and for medicine. So love is this kind of miraculous uh, panacea. Rumi also talks about the idea that love and, and this is where he's said to pertain to a school of love in Sufism, where love is the all paramount important thing. Um, love trumps asceticism. So if you are worshiping God because you're fearing hell, or you're worshiping God because you're hoping for the reward of heaven, you're not really worshiping out of a sense of love. It's an ascetic kind of worship. And asceticism is important in the Sufi tradition, but it's limited. So Rumi talks sometimes comparing the uh, difference between what the ascetic orientation is to religion and what the lover's orientation is. And so in the Masnavi, he says, the fearful ascete, the one practicing asceticism, treks his faith on foot. The lovers flash ahead like lightning wind. Um, he also says that the Sufis, because they are people who have tried to burnish their hearts and to weed away the impurities of the lesser promptings of the human experience, are seated by kings, and they often are seated by kings in the medieval period, in front. So on the right-hand side would be the royal guards, and on the left-hand side would be the minister of state, and in front are the Sufis. And Rumi has an explanation for why he thinks that is. He says, they give the Sufis pride of place in front, who like mirrors to the eye reflect soul. Burnished by remembrance, contemplation, their mirror hearts receive pristine image. Beauties in love with its mirror image, burnishing souls, instilling God in hearts. So the asceticism of uh, Sufi practice can lead to a kind of appreciation of beauty and love, but it is a limited um, aspect of spirituality compared to love. Love is also superior to rationality. You can try to understand things like a philosopher, but as Rumi says, the philosoph winds up through doubt, conjecture, in denial bash your head against the wall. So throw away all that rationality. He says, far-sighted reason, I have tested it. Henceforth, I'll make myself demented. So if you want to solve your questions through uh, rationality, you'll only get so far, it's better to be demented. He also cautions that you have to be dispassionate in trying to approach scripture. So he says, your passions will lead you a reading of Quran, how base and bent you make the clear intent. So it's possible to be a devout religious person and not to get the message of uh, your scripture. So love is a cosmic force for Rumi. He seems to posit it here as the primal element of creation. It's waves of love that make the heavens turn. Without that love, the universe would freeze. No mineral absorbed by vegetable, no growing thing consumed by animal, no sacrifice of anima for him who inspired Mary with his pregnant breath. 
like ice, all of them unmoved, frozen stiff, no vibrant molecules in swarms of motion, lovers of perfection, every atom turns sapling-like to face the sun and grow, their haste to shed their fleshly form for soul sings out an orison of praise to God. So you can see here the uh, image of Mary, who is important in Islamic theology, especially in Sufism. Rumi frequently talks about the process of spiritual uh, realization on the part of disciples as giving birth to the Jesus in your soul. And that requires you to become like Mary. So she's a very important symbol in his uh, theology. So love is a mystic force, it's kind of energy. He talks about it as being the astrolabe of divine mysteries. Astrolabe is that device that they would use for navigation in the medieval period. Um, he also says that you cannot possibly fully understand things uh, as they relate to the Godhead, which we understand through this act of love. One point in the Mass Navi, he says, love's detailed explanations still untold, though judgment days, hundreds, may come and go for the length of the judgment day is fixed, but how curtail description of the Lord? So this love is directed towards understanding or embracing the idea of the divinity. He also says somewhere else, love cannot be carried or contained in words. Love's an ocean of unfathomed depth. Infinite, the ocean's drops of water, yet the seven seas, tiny next to love. So again, it's, a, it's an idea that love is the dominant force or energy in the universe. He also wrote, he didn't actually write, his disciples took down notes of the lectures that he gave. And in one of his lectures, he talks about duality. He says that when you are worshiping God, you have to remove your ego because there's not room enough in your heart for two egos. That is God's ego and your own ego. So he says in God's presence, there is no room for two egos. You say ego, I, and he says ego, is that possible? Either you die in his presence or he will die in your presence, which would not be a good thing, so that no duality may remain. Yet it is impossible that he should die either in the universe or in the mind, for he is the living who does not die. And that's a quotation from the Quran. He has grace in such measure that were it possible, he would die for you to remove the duality. But since his death is impossible, you die, so that he may become manifest in you and the duality be lifted. So he talks oftentimes about this sense of double vision that we have in a world of duality, and he urges us to overcome that separation. And he talks about that in terms of an erotic love relationship. He says that everything is the beloved, and the lover, the act of dividing the beloved, which is everything, into lover and beloved, is itself a form of duality. The fact that there is a lover separated from the beloved means that you're blocking access to the one subject. So he says, remove the veils and tell the naked truth. Who sleeps in carnal embrace with their clothes? You have to remove that duality and the barrier of lover and beloved in order to truly unite. So for him, the unity of being is as true for the relationship of a believer to a believer as it is for a believer to God. And he talks at another point in the Mass Navi about this. I speak of plural souls in name alone. One soul becomes 100 in their frames. Just as God's single sun in heaven shines on earth and lights a hundred walls, but all these beams of light return to one if you remove the walls that block the sun. The walls of houses do not stand forever, and believers then will be as but one soul. So he's imagining that just as shadows are created by the sun hitting implements in the earth, on the earth, uh, in the afterlife, the individuation of souls is removed and all of that energy, that spiritual energy, returns to its unitary state. Um, so he, 
I'm gonna skip over this one. He talks about love as being a chain of being almost, if we want to think about Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and love is God, essentially. And so we're moving up the scale of the chain of being towards God. And he says, I died to mineral, joined the realm of plants. I died to vegetable, joined animal. I died from animal to human realm. So why fear? When has dying made me less? So the medieval idea is that these, the, the mineral world is lower than the plant world, and the plant world is lower than the animal world. So you've been moving up. You've been progressing all this way. So why fear? When has dying made me less? In turn, again, I'll die from human form, only to sprout an angel's head and wings. And then from angel form, I will ebb away for, and this is a quotation from the Quran, for all things perish but the face of God. And once I'm sacrificed from angel form, I'm what imagination can't contain. So let me be not. Notness, like a fugue, sings to me. We verily return to him, which is also a quotation from the Quran, which is typically recited at the death of an individual. So he's imagining that as a return to the divine source, just like the reed has been cut from its bed in the reed uh, uh, condition and is now divorced from him. At some point, it may be able to return to God. So based upon this theology of love, both eros and agape, Rumi talks about a kind of tolerance or concludes that we should have a kind of tolerance, that we're really not living in a situation where we can see the true nature of uh, unity. So if you think about light hitting a prism, light is white, it hits the prism, it becomes all different colors. He's urging us that we're living in the world of colors and dividing things up. If you could simply go back to the point before the light hits the prism, you would see that everyone is one. He talks about it in this way in the Mass Navi, slapped by the polo stick of his command. So polo is the royal sport in medieval Persia, and it's played with a, with a club, right? Um, and a polo ball. So he's imagining the human soul when it's created by God as having been slapped by the command or the swing of the divine polo stick. Slapped by the polo stick of his command, be, and it was. That's God's command of creation, be, and it was. We roll through space and beyond. When the colorless became enmeshed in colors, a Moses came in conflict with a Moses. So in this world where we live, in the prismatic world, Moses can seem to be in conflict with Moses. We're living in this conflict-created, colorful world. But if you gain back that colorlessness you once had, with Moses and Pharaoh, peace will reign. So even the mortal enemies of Pharaoh and Moses would, in that pre-prismatic realm, be part of that same love. So the Masnavi concludes, mind of the universe, point of view makes all the difference we see between believing Muslim, Zoroast, a Zoroastrian, and Jew. There isn't any difference. It's just the point uh, of the prism that we're looking from that makes it appear that there is a difference. He also says, we all were parts of Adam at one time. In paradise, we all have heard these tunes. Through clay and Though clay and water fill us up with doubts, we still remember something of those songs. And that is the idea of this reed. The reed does remember that it came from the reed bed, and we, if we develop our spiritual perception, Rumi says, we'll hear some of the echoes of our divine origins and be able to, or be attracted towards striving to uh, recreate that kind of um, vision of unitary oneness. So love for him is a kind of cosmic vision and it leads to a transcendent tolerant view of religion. So he also says in the Masnavi, 
As I enter the solitude of prayer, I put these matters to him, for he knows. That's my prayer time habit, to turn and talk. That's why it's said, my heart delights in prayer. Through pureness, a window opens in my soul. God's message comes immediate to me. Through my window, the book, the rain, and light all pour into my room from gleaming source. Hell's the room in which there is no window. To open windows, that's religion's goal. So it's a very modern kind of thinking about um, religious uh, truth, um, though he is very grounded in the Islamic tradition. Some people have argued that his spiritual stance comes out of a Sufi tradition that does not depend on prayer or fasting or the kinds of things that are associated with the observance of Islam. That's just not true. He has many other poems that talk about fasting, that talk about prayer, um, that talk about um, religious rituals and uh, laws and so forth. Okay, so here is that shrine as it was being turned into a museum of antiquities uh, in 1927 after the dervish lodges were banned. So in 1926, it became no longer possible to publicly perform the turning ceremony in Turkey. And it was not allowed in public until 1955, when it was allowed only as a cultural dance. So it was performed in the gym, in the basketball gym in Konya, uh, for the first time in 30 years as a demonstration of uh, the uh, cultural traditions of Turkey. Uh, nowadays, there are a number of people who see themselves as continuing the tradition of the Mevlevi order. They're not doing so in the traditional sense, which is to say that all throughout the time from the death of Rumi up until 1926, there was a continuous transmission. So you would learn, you'd be initiated into the order, you would learn from a guide, you would stay in the kitchen for three years before you could begin turning, and uh, you had therefore a special kind of training. That no longer exists, but there are people who perform the meditative uh, turning of the Mevlevis as a spiritual exercise, and there are other people who do it sort of like a civil war reenactment. That is to say, it's a Turkish cultural practice, and it's kind of a club that they get together to do things on the weekend, and sometimes they get sent overseas representing Turkey's spirituality as a group of Mevlevi dancers. So uh, there you can see a modern interpretation of uh, Mevlevi turning. Uh, this is from the Journal of the Mevlevi Order of America. So there is a Mevlevi or Whirling Dervish Order in America. And I just wanted to close with a couple of poems that um, I thought were representative in a couple of aspects of uh, Rumi's teaching that maybe deserve more emphasis than they've received in the past. So oftentimes, Rumi is portrayed as somebody who is the guru on the hill who is imperturbable. He's quietly sitting there, and he knows everything. And if you come up to him, uh, he'll bestow wisdom on you. He doesn't really see his spiritual life in those terms. He saw it as a struggle. He saw it as a frenetic struggle, particularly when Shams departed. He was, for many years, distraught and frenzied. And um, those kinds of aspects of his poetry are often not presented in translation. So I want to read this poem for you. Maybe I'll read you the Persian first, and then the translation. Che donestam ki in soda mara zin san konad majnun, delam ra du zahi sa zad do cheshmam ra konad jehun. 
چه دانستم که سلابی مرا ناگاه برباید چو کشتیم در اندازد میان قلزوم پرخون زند موجی بران کشتی که تخت تخته بشکافد که هر تخته فرو ریزد ز گردش های گوناگون نهنگی هم برارد سر خورد آن آب دریا را چونان دریای بی پایان شود بی آب چون هامون شکافد نیز آن هامون نهنگ بر فرسا را کشد در قهر ناگهان به دست قهر چون قارون چون این تبدیل ها آمد نه هامون ماند و نه دریا چه دانم من دیگر چون شد که چون غرق است در بیچون چه دانم های بسیار است لیکن من نمیدانم که خوردم از دهان بندی در آن دریا کفی افیون so uh, one thing that you need to know about this is the reference to kora who is thought to have been the richest man in the ancient world uh, but he died uh, with his wealth under the earth, which is said to be an exemplary fate for people who want to amass riches. And this is one of the few places in Rumi's work where he seems to be talking about a visionary experience. How could I know this melancholy would make me so crazy, make of my heart a hell, of my two eyes raging rivers? How could I know a torrent would snatch me out of nowhere away, toss me like a ship upon a sea of blood, that waves would crack that ship's ribs board by board, tear with endless pitch and yaw each plank, that a leviathan would rear its head, gulp down that ocean's water, that such an endless ocean could dry up like a desert, that the sea-quenching serpent could then split that desert, could jerk me of a sudden, like Korah, with the hand of wrath deep into a pit. When these transmissions came, transmutations came about, no trace remained of that desert or the sea. How should I know how it, how it all happened, since how drowned within howlessness? So one of the Sufis' names for God is the howless. You cannot question why things happen, how, how they happen. So God is the howless, beyond the question of how. So he's saying here, how should I know how it all happened, since how, the question how, drowned within howlessness. What a multiplicity of how could I knows, but I don't know, for to counter that sea rushing in my mouth, I swallowed a froth of opium. So opium here is indicative of the kind of disorienting experience that he's had, but it's also uh, used medicinally as an antidote to certain illnesses, in this case, uh, hallucination. And finally, since we are talking about the idea of love, this poem, and I'll just read you the English for this one, and hopefully you can hear the internal rhyme and rhythm of this poem in, in the English. I have this friend, I have this cave, I am gutted by love. You are that friend, you are that cave. My Lord, don't cast me off. You are Noah, you are Newman, you are conqueror, you are conquest, you are the breast laid open. I stand at the door of mysteries. You are light, you are festival, you are fortune, God confirmed. You're the bird of Mount Sinai, I, the wounded captive in your beak. A drop you are, the sea you are, grace you are, wrath you are, sugar, poison you are, you are. Do not afflict me any longer. You are the solar sign, the house of Venus, the paradise of hope. Let me in, my friend. You are daylight, you are fasting, you are the wages of our begging. You are water, you are jug. Let this lover drink. You are bait, you are the trap, you are wine, you are the cup, you are cooked, you are raw. Please do not leave me raw. If this flesh would stop its spinning, my heart would not be robbed so dizzy. You left town, so I would not prattle on incessantly. So people say that this poem, and we don't really know this for sure, but it makes some sense, is composed on one of the occasions after Shamps left Konya and abandoned Rumi to his own devices. So thank you for your attention, and if there are questions, I'll be happy to dodge them. <laughs> when we were in Istanbul um, in 1999, we did see them 
the attorney at our hotel. Uh -huh. So I assume those were the rather fake ones, <laughs> I want to call them. Well, there are more than one hotel that have yeah. that um, yeah. going on. And, there um, is a lodge uh, which operated in medieval times in Galata. So near the Galata Tower, if you went there, mm -hmm. there is actually a Mevlevi Lodge where they still do performances. And it was, it was obligatory for any European travelers in the 19th century to go to that lodge and see the dervish ceremonies. People like Hans Christian Andersen went there. Mm -hmm. Everybody who was anybody in Istanbul went there. So that's part of a, a long and sacred tradition of European tourists. Okay. <laughs> And they also told us that the reason they don't get dizzy and fall over is because they have their heads to the side. Yeah. Their heads are on their shoulders, or try to, as close to their shoulders as you can get. And that's why it keeps you from getting dizzy and just falling down. So when they started to learn that, they used to, in the lodge, have a peg on the floor, and they would put their big toe around that peg and that would help to stabilize where you were in terms of the rest of the room. Can you speak a little bit about the significance of Nasruddin stories? And so those are folkloric stories, Hoja Na Mola Nasruddin. Um, they are sometimes used by Sufis as teaching stories. So they're kind of like Zen cones. They give you some kind of nonsense, something that stuns your reason that you really can't figure out, like a door in the middle of the desert that uh, Mullah Nasruddin insists on going through all the time, but there's no building around it. Um, uh, or, for example, that he is seen in an area looking for his donkey and people say, well, there's no donkey here. Why are you looking for it here? And he says, well, this is where it was when I lost it. And um, uh, it's, it's not directly related to the Sufi tradition, although the kinds of stories that sometimes appear in the Masnavi in various places are not totally dissimilar from that. And they do draw on previous literature as well as on folk stories, sometimes on dirty jokes, uh, uh, and all kinds of material that uh, he's using in order to please or capture the attention of the audience. So in that respect, it's, it's not very dissimilar from the kinds of things that are used in some Sufi stories. Okay, it's just a silly question. Oh, okay, <laughs> definitely. There is a lovely gown the person is wearing. Yes. Is there like trousers underneath or is yes. there just billowing <laughs> gown or? Yes, so each of the Sufi orders, okay. so there are a number of different Sufi orders that are built around the tradition of a particular saint or figure. And many of them have clothes that are specific to their order. Um, and they have rituals that are specific to their order. The Mevlevi orders, distinctive clothing is this white long robe and the conical hat that they're wearing. So the other orders don't generally have that. Um, and it is something that you only get to wear, again, once you're past the initiation point and are thought to have made progress within a certain level of understanding. So Sufis divide the experience of progress along the spiritual path in terms of stations and uh, stages. And those stations may come and go. The stages are permanent kinds of attainment. And once you get to that certain level of attainment in the Mevlevi tradition, you can start practicing this uh, meditative format and you get the uniform that goes with it. In the portion of your uh, talk that talked about uh, religious tolerance, uh, there was a, one of his poems where he talked about the difference between Muslims and Jews mm -hmm. being more a matter of, per of perspective than anything else. It, that seems like such a, at least in today's world, it seems like such an absolutely radical thing to say. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about 
kind of where he sat it, within his time, whether he was kind of viewed in a very rebellious, radical sense, or whether he was kind of a mainstream poet, teacher, some, something, you know, just some thoughts along those lines. So there are some orthodox orientations in the Islamic tradition that reject Sufism. But in particular, what they reject is the worship of saints, visitation of saints' tombs, uh, the prayer to a saint to intercede for you uh, rather than praying directly to God, which is it's quite common in popular Islamic um, devotions in the medieval period for people to intercede with a holy figure rather than asking God directly. And there are a number of scholars who consider those to be blasphemous uh, innovations in the bad sense, so heretical kinds of things. Typically, though, this is not the sort of thing that people would object to at an abstract level. They might object to it in practice if it came down to deciding a court case between a Muslim and a Jew, there might be some sensitivities about uh, which community is thought to be rightfully the dominant community in, an era, in, an, in a particular area. Um, so I don't, you can't really answer that question in an absolute way, but in the, in the realm of poetry, it's not terribly exceptional. There are other people that say similar things. In fact, I skipped over a poem from Ibn Arabi, who was born in the south of Spain, in Andalusia, and uh, composed a poem that talks about a rather similar idea. And I can actually play you a rendition of that. If so this is an Arabic poem. Ibn Arabi. لقد كنت قبل اليوم أنكر صاحبي إذا لم يكن ديني إلى دينه داني وقد صار قلبي قابلا كل صورة لقد صار قلبي قابلا كل صورة So her performance of this poem ends with that line, love is my faith and creed. So here's another poet from slightly earlier period. Um, he died in 1240, so during Rumi's lifetime. Also in, he had been in Anatolia, in the same city where Rumi was, his son-in-law was uh, teaching, was promoting his teachings. So it's not uncommon, it wasn't the dominant form of understanding of religion, but it's something that was widely understood by certain communities. <laughs> <laughs> 